All right, church, you can have a seat. You know, Sam mentioned this during the uh, announcements this morning, but today is a church meeting of sorts. You know, so I'm sorry if you're visiting, if you haven't been here for a while, whatever the case may be, but uh, a couple times a year, we, we try to do this. At least we have. We've, we've done this twice a year since we started. We, we launched Easter of 2017. And so twice a year, we've kind of gotten together and said, this is where we're at as a church. This is what the Lord is doing. This is where we're moving to. And we're going to do that today. And I'd invite you to join us next week. We're going to jump into the book of Philippians since we finally finished the book of Judges. And we'll start that next week. Uh, I do want to remind you also in the announcements today, we don't do a lot of events, okay? But we do have a couple coming up. The Red Registration for the Women's Conference is on the website. You can hit that up. There's a button up at the top of the page if you want to register for that. It's coming up this Saturday. And then our youth retreat sign up is also on the church website. And so hit that up for a little bit later. That's at the end of the summer before everybody goes back to school at the end of July. So registration is up for that too. Uh, on the church website. Now, as far as notes and things today, I don't have a specific passage for you to open up to because I'm going to be just sharing a lot of details, a lot of practical things today, uh, and then just a little bit of ministry philosophy. So there may be some notes to take, but you don't have to flip around in your Bibles and follow after me today. Uh, we'll put some things up on the screen. But uh, before I even go into this, these are the messages, these are the things that actually flip me out a little bit. Like I would much prefer us to just be sitting down in a passage and going verse by verse through it because I don't know how all this is going to come out today, okay? There's going to be some wild cards in here, which means I can stick my foot in my mouth even more than usual, all right? And if you've been around, you know it happens, okay? So we'll, we'll see how this is going to go. So we should probably pray before we start this process. Would you all agree? Yeah, I'd say it's a good idea. Okay, let's bow, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to, Father, just to address your people. And um, Father, I pray that you would gather us. I, I see so much in the New Testament about us being of one mind and one spirit and one heart and the role that your word plays in bringing us to that place. And so, Holy Spirit, would you produce in us a sense of unity? And Father, as, as Jeff prayed a little while ago, we just praise you for the fruit that we've seen as a part of this church over the last couple years. And we give it all back to you. We recognize and we confess that there is no fruit that's a work of our hands. That your Holy Spirit produces it. You, you've made it for us to walk in good works, but that all the glory goes to you. That it's all because of you and it's by you and it's for you. And we reserve none of the glory, Father. It is all yours. Father, I, I'm just grateful personally uh, to be able to take part in it and to be able to partner um, with these and to be able to partner with you in ministry and seeing your kingdom grow. We pray that you would be with us now, that you would cause these things to come out clearly, that you would help me to answer practical questions and things of that nature. And uh, Father, just, just lead us. You, you have, you've provided everything that's been necessary over the last couple years. I have no doubt that you will continue to do so. And so lead us in this time. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right, I don't know if I really needed to title this thing today, but I did anyway. Uh, the title of the, of the message, or whatever you want to call this today, is Here We Grow Again. Now, I titled it that, just so you all know, I have a little bit of a sense of humor. It's a little bit dry sometimes. I titled it that because it simply makes me laugh. That's why I titled it that. Because what made me laugh was two things. That's about as cliche of a title as I could possibly come up with, so that made me laugh. Number two, uh, I just really thought of Jeff with a wig on singing White Snake up here as the opening song before we went into the message. Yes, absolutely, okay? So tune in, maybe next week, that would be phenomenal, okay? What's that? Well, you can grow your beard out longer, but the rest ain't going to get there, you know what I'm saying? All right, that's between me and you, bro, it's just not happening, all right? Anyway, put all that aside, here we grow again. I want you to think about something. As we move into the next year, we've had two years of ministry as a part of our church. This church did not exist outside the mind and heart of God a little more than two years ago. And in those two years, God has done phenomenal things. And the first year of our church body was a time of, of staggering numerical growth. Now, you may not think that, we, you know, that with some of the things that are coming today, you may, you may think there's still room in here. But if you look around, when, when school is in session, when our college students are here, and we are not simply a college church, there are probably 70 kids on the other side of these walls right now. 
But when our college students are here and when school is in and people are not traveling, you can automatically just put another 150 people in this room right now, okay? And most of that numerical growth came in the first year of our church. The second year of our church was much more, we've still grown some numerically, but it's been a small percentage. It's been much more about our growth as a community. It's been much more about our growth in terms of missions. It's been much more in terms of growth with us growing together and growing into the plan that God has for our church. So as I address that, I want you to understand the title for me is not us about aiming for uh, attendance growth. It's to, I'll put it like this. I want us to be mindful that we would grow, but not necessarily that we would grow. You understand what I'm saying? I want us to be thoughtful about our growth, but not necessarily always pursuing our growth. You know what I'm saying? I think God desires us for, to work to grow, but not necessarily to work to grow. You understand what I'm saying? Some of you are like, yeah, I get what you're saying. Some of you are like, you have lost your ever-loving mind. Okay, I'll explain a little bit more as we go, but we will talk about some of these things. Now, before we go any further, there are plenty of things that I will not have time to address today, um, a lot of things. So I'm going to share a couple of messages up on the screen with you because I know that a lot of you guys have become a part of our church body over the course of two years. You weren't necessarily here in the beginning, okay? And just out of curiosity, how many in the room right now have been with us since the very beginning of the church? Let me see, hands up. All right, sweet, okay? But that means the majority in the room have not. You've come into the church at different times in our history, so there are some things about us you may not have heard or you may not understand or some questions that you may have. And so I'm going to give you, you know, direct access, the titles of some of the past messages or family meetings so you can go back and listen to some of these things. I think they'll be up on the screen. So if you go to our website, thechapelcleveland.com, we have an archive of all of our past teachings. You're you're going to go to teachings, you're going to go to topical messages, and then there's one from uh, November 15th, 2017 called Membership Has Its Privileges. All right, do we have that? Is it up there? All right, there we go, okay. Membership Has Its Privileges, uh, Are We There Yet? from April 22nd, 2018, and then an update on the chapel from November 25th, 2018. Those are three of these family meetings that we've done in the past, and they're going to give you a lot of information that I'm not going to be able to give you here today because we have some super brass tacks practical things that we need to talk about and communicate today. And if you go to that place, you know, th those messages... Here are some of the things you're going to learn. You're going to learn about who we are and where we come from, our affiliation as a Calvary Chapel, our ministry background, things of that nature. You're going to hear a little bit about our story and how God planted this design in mind and called us to come to Cleveland, Tennessee, of all places, because y'all know Cleveland needed another church. That's why we came to Cleveland, because it needed another church in Cleveland, Tennessee, because there ain't enough churches in Cleveland, Tennessee. Y'all know that, right? So it tells our story and our calling and things of that nature. It talks about our structure, our accountability okay how we're designed you know as a leadership group and things like that and if there's anybody watching out over us by the way a little side note here as I was kind of reading studying and looking and thinking and praying about the weekend we're going to be talking about our facility some today this relates uh, somewhat to accountability and things like that that you guys need to be aware of D did you know that there are many 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 churches in our country whose assets are either owned by the pastor or by the denomination. Did y'all know that? Okay. Do a little research. It's very, very interesting. Okay. This relates very much to a sense of, okay, what is accountability and what's the structure and what do these things look like and things of that nature. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Our desire is to be accountable but flexible at the same time. And there tend to be reactions on either side of that and a lot of times in whatever church structures uh, you look at, okay? Uh, what else we learn? How to become a part of the chapel, okay? Is there membership? How do I join? Like, what do I do if I want to get involved? That type of question. And also our ministry philosophy. We're still going to talk about that some today because we have to come back to it, okay? You guys have to understand what our ministry philosophy and our aim is because it totally shapes us as a church. And if you understand our ministry philosophy, well, then you're going to understand a lot of other things about us that you don't necessarily even have to be told if you understand what is most important to us, okay? 
But um, if you check those out, that's a, that has a, access to a lot of information I'm not going to be able to get to. But as we go towards the next year, let me tell you some areas that myself as your pastor and as a leadership group in our church, these are some areas that I would love to see us grow and where, frankly, I think the Holy Spirit aims to do some things within our church body, both in and through our church. One is, this one's super practical. I know and we know as a staff that we need to grow in our communication. As a matter of fact, our newest staff member, uh, Kelly Thompson, she, her, her job is split between C Kids Ministry and also helping us with our communication. That's a very practical thing, but that's one of the reasons that we do this once or twice a year, too, is to continue to open up the avenues of communication as well. A second thing, this one's not quite as practical, although it will have some practical manifestations in the future. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We believe that God wants our church to grow in this balance between uh, truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? We believe that this is something that God wants to do in and through our church, and we believe this is one of the reasons that God chose Cleveland, Tennessee for us to plant in. We desire to be a church that is led by the Word of God and empowered by the Spirit of God, okay? And we want to walk in that balance, and we want to know what that means in the context of of the church. We also believe that we are going to grow, that God wants us to grow in terms of our community, our relationship, okay? How many of y'all know our, our word for community in our church? What is it? It's withness, okay? God wants us to grow in our withness as a church and in our hospitality, our care for strangers, in our care even for one another inside uh, the church. We do that primarily through small groups, okay? Uh, the refrain for our church is very simple in terms of how you get involved. It's come to services, join a small group, find a place to serve, okay? And frankly, and I want you guys to know this, our ministry philosophy is that probably 80% or so, and I'm just putting a number on there, it's kind of, it's kind of my idea, all right? I didn't get this in out of any textbook or anything like that. But I believe that about 80% of our pastoral ministry will happen within the context of our small groups, okay? That means people caring for each other, reaching out to one another, praying for one another, meeting each other's needs, you know, whatever the case may be. It doesn't absolve the church as a, as a larger entity from participating in that. But I believe that in some place over the years, we've taken all of that responsibility away from the body of Christ and tried to place it upon just a few staff people. And that's part of the reason we're not as cared for as we should be within the context of the body of Christ. So I believe, and a part of our ministry philosophy is, that growth in community includes that pastoral care that we receive from each other within the context of the body, and that happens through small groups. We also desire to grow in our missionality, okay? Now, this is, this is the, one of the phenomenal things and one of the encouraging things for me that has happened over the course of this last year, all right? The first year of our church is when we grew all these people. It seemed like every week, new people were coming, new people, new people, new people, and it was growing and growing. We need to set out some more chairs and more chairs and more chairs. What are we going to do when the room can't hold them and all this kind of stuff, all right? But that first year, we had two mission trips, and we sent 10 people from our church body uh, into a short-term mission trip. This year, we prepared four mission trips. Jeff is the one who prepares all these. He, that's part of his responsibility as a part of our ministry is not just worship, but also outreach. So he organized, organized four mission trips this year, and we're having 50-plus people participate in those mission trips. All right? That, to me, is growth, Right? That is growth. That is a desiring to participate in the kingdom of God. That's a, a desire to put, to some degree, to put your money where your mouth is, right? To participate in that work. That is the thing we are probably most excited about as a church. And that is an area we want to continue to grow is in our missionality. Domestically, internationally, and right here in Cleveland, Tennessee. And by the way, a huge part of the mission of our outreach ministry, of our missions ministry, is to remind us all and use those avenues, those short-term trips to remind us that there is no longer any priesthood that is reserved for the guy up here in front of the people with the collar on. Who are the priests in the modern age of the church, y'all? They're all of us. They're all of us. 
And, and just because I can't help myself to the Honduras team that is here, okay, I want you to know that God has riled you up over the course of the last week, and He has shown you such great need while you have been on the mission field and in Honduras and working with those orphans. Now, I don't want to allow the enemy, though, to get a foothold in your heart when you're walking around Cleveland, Tennessee, and you see our culture where, for the most part, we are so well provided for. We have money, and we have cars, and we have houses, and we have clothes, and we have food, and we have families, and all those kinds of things. But if you will look past the surface of those material things, you will see a people right here around you, day in and day out, in your classrooms, in your jobs, and in your families, whose spiritual need is is just as great, if not greater, than those that you encountered on the mission field. You understand? So don't allow the affluence to get in the way of a spiritual understanding of the needs that are in the heart, okay? We want you to come back with a missionality and a desire to be ministers and priests in your culture, in your town, in your work, in your school, and in your family. That is one of the large, I mean, heartbeats behind our outreach and missions ministry. We want to grow in terms of our worship. Part of something we discussed as a staff and that we've prayed for for you guys and for myself and for us as a church is that we would have more of a sense of freedom and expression in our worship to God. Because I think in a lot of ways our worship is contingent on how we feel and not on the one who we worship, who is just as valuable day in and day out and whose character never changes no matter how we feel when we walk in the doors. And we want us to grow in our expression of worship. We also want to grow in our discipleship, okay? And a big one here when it comes to discipleship, you see, we want to be a church who equips. I'll talk about this a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, but for, for example, the women's conference this weekend. The women's conference this weekend, I, you know, I don't think I'm giving anything away. I'm not supposed to give away. But it essentially is going to be worship an exhortation to apply yourself to the Word of God, and then some equipping and instruction on how to do so. Okay, That's what we want to grow in. And one of the areas we want to grow in that is also in our Sea Kids ministry. Okay, See, because our heartbeat behind Sea Kids is not just to take care of your kids for an hour, hour and a half to give you a little bit of peace while you're in here. Now, y'all know if you're around, do we have adult conversations in this room? Yes, just go back a couple chapters in Judges and you'll find out what I'm talking about. We talk about adult things in here and I always let y'all know we ain't skipping over nothing, okay? And I understood that was a double negative and I said ain't and everything in a sentence, but y'all were, were from the South, right? It's okay. Y'all forgive me? Yeah? Well, it doesn't matter if you do or not. I'm going to say it again, all right? Aight? <laughs> yeah. So in our Sea Kids ministry, we want to be about equipping and discipling them as well. You know, so just in case you didn't understand, we have a goal back there with our kids when they're back there, including my kids. You know, I've got two kids that are back there on a weekly basis. Uh, our infants, you know, infant, one, two years old, the desire of our Sea Kids ministry is simply to show them that God loves them and that they're safe, okay? They're safe, and the God's, God's church and God's people is a safe place for them. When you go up a couple years for you know, three, four, five years old, our goal is to show them that Jesus Christ died for their sins and invites them into a relationship with God, that God desires relationship with His children. Okay, And then for our older ones in that, we want to disciple them. We want to see them walk in depth of relationship with the Lord through the study of His Word. And we're introducing inductive Bible study principles to those children, those, those primary age children, trying to sow some very small seeds of study principles into their lives. And frankly, we're working towards, I may say this again in a little while, bringing some of them into this environment so that they can worship with us and participate in worship with the body while they go back in there to do some of their Bible study. And they even to have some, some discussion-oriented activities because that's kind of what we do in the body. We get around, we have fellowship with one another, and we do it over God's Word. And we want to introduce that to them even when they're in primary school back there. So, all these goals, all these desires of things to grow in, right? 
Not necessarily growth numerically, not necessarily like, hey, let's get everybody to come to the church, but we're talking about spiritual growth. We're talking about growth for us as a body. We're talking about growth into God's Word and in missionality and worship and these types of things. We're talking about sanctification and equipping and the things that are supposed to happen in the church. So how do we grow in these things? Well, um, I think that has to do with how we view church and the purpose of the church. And we view the church as a shepherding ministry. Okay, We view this as a shepherding ministry. Meaning that our desire and our goal is to shepherd those who God has brought. Okay, It doesn't mean you shouldn't evangelize. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go out into your culture or whatever the case may be. But we feel like our responsibility as a church is to see the sanctification, the spiritual growth, the discipleship, and the equipping of those God has brought. We go about the business of a shepherding ministry. Now, in thinking about this, I'll read you a little scripture, kind of where this comes from in my mind. First Peter chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 3. We actually talked about this as we went through First Peter a few months ago. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. All right, so what does this mean? A shepherding ministry. Shepherding, y'all, you know, in case you know, you're not aware of the, the idea, shepherding is hard work. Shepherding is no shortcuts. You know what shepherding is? It's teaching the Word of God in season and out of season. You know what shepherding is? Encouraging others to pray. Shepherding is meeting needs and binding the broken and reaching out to those who need mercy and compassion and providing where there needs to be provision and correcting sometimes where there needs to be correction or rebuke. It's the hard work of the gospel. And we do it over and over and over and over and over and we do not quit doing the hard work of the gospel. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the type of church that I want us to be. That's the type of church that I think God has in mind in his word. And then he becomes responsible for all those other things. He becomes responsible for everything else. We apply ourselves to what we know, how we're supposed to lead and guide the church and how we interact with it. And we leave everything else on his plate. Okay. It reminds me of a quote from uh, one of my favorite movies. Anybody remember the Titan fans in here? Remember the Titans? It's a great movie, right? Okay. Herman Boone, right? You know, the coach. Here's what he says. I run six plays, split veer like Novocaine. Just give it time. It always works. Now, what does works mean? Does that mean if we just do the hard work of ministry, we're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and we're going to be the flagship church of this, that, or the other, and all the people are going to come? And this? Absolutely not. But you know what it does mean? If we are faithful to perform God's work, we will be faithful in His eyes. You know what I'm saying? And that's the goal. We want to be faithful in God's eyes to do what He has asked us to do, to take care of what He has put in our hands, and to shepherd as well as we can. And we will miss things, and we will drop things, and we will be imperfect at it, and, and we will have to be corrected, and God will have to, you know, He'll have to teach us and He'll have to train us up because we will never be perfect in us. But that is the goal, and that is how we want to grow in these things. All right, now, this is the part where I got to get real brass tacks practical with you guys, okay? All right, so here's the, there's the transition. What a segue that was, right? You know, it's real gentle, okay? It's like a 90-degree turn. That's who we want to be. We'll come back to our ministry philosophy in a little while, but I'm going to make, make a little sandwich for you guys in the middle of some of the details of what are coming up, okay? As a church, uh, we've, we've had so many conversations over the last couple years. What we have right now, when you just look around this room and when you account for the other people that are traveling and on vacation and the 100 college students that are not here with us today and things like that, that was not even in my mind when this church started, okay? What we have is so much more than what I envisioned, okay? And, and just to kind of prove the point to you, um, we almost got into a contract in the very beginning, the launch of this church where our worship would have been in a room that held a maximum capacity of 135 people. Now, I can tell you right now, if we would have gotten into that situation, we would have been in a mess. 
You know, we would have been in a mess. It would have been, now maybe, anyway, I don't want to get into all that, okay? All that to say is, God had a different design in mind, and he had some different plans in mind than I had when the church started. And so from that very beginning, we've been having conversations the whole time that have very practical manifestations. Are we in the right place? Do we need to be looking for something? What about a building? Should we rent? Should we buy? Should we long-term, short-term, you know, improvements, old building, new building, you know, stay mobile, you know, what permanent facility, all this kind of stuff. We've had these conversations all throughout the history of our church. Now, going back about eight months or so, I would say about October and November of 2018, somebody approached us about the opportunity for another facility. So let me go ahead and throw it out there, and then I'll answer the questions for you guys. As of the, the first Sunday in July, which I think is July, is it 6th or the 7th? July 7th, okay? We are moving to a Coe Middle School. We're moving to a Coe Middle School uh, the first weekend in July. So June is our last month here at Cleveland Middle, Okay. One other change to mention with that is we're going back to our original start time. We're moving to 1030 on Sunday mornings uh, starting in July 7th over at Ocoee Middle School. Okay, so that's the practical aspect of what's happening right now for us as a church. Now, I know that some of you guys are like, whoa, where'd that come from? Like, I didn't see that coming up. This has been a conversation that's been ongoing, like I said, since October or November. This has involved our entire staff. This has involved people that are sitting in the audience who are not staff. This has involved our board. We've been kicking this around for months and months and months and visiting and talking and praying and asking ourselves and clarifying what are the goals? What are we trying to accomplish here? Are we trying to make something happen? Like, what should we do? What's the right thing to do? And, and asking God to intervene, okay? Asking God to show us what His will is. And I find it a little bit interesting because uh, as a part of this conversation, we, we've, we've gone through times where we've heavily been investing in this conversation. Like, we're talking about it all the time. We're breaking everything down. What have we missed? What do we need to know? What, what do we need to look at? You know, what new thing do we need to talk about? And then we've been through other seasons in that time where it hasn't been quite as prevalent. But one of the seasons we're deeply having these conversations was while we were teaching through the book of Judges and we were talking about Gideon. Now, what's one of the, what's one of the concepts that's introduced to us in Scripture in the story of Gideon? Do you all remember what he did to try to clarify the voice of the Lord? He threw out a fleece, right? Now, I'll be the first to tell you, I think there are right reasons and wrong reasons and right you know, ways and wrong ways to go about a fleece. I think sometimes we can use that principle to demand of God. Okay, We went to the Lord as humbly as we could and we said, hey, we're not quite sure what to do here. There are kind of a lot of pros and cons both ways and we're not exactly sure what we should do. And we kind of put down a little bit of a fleece. Because there is an investment required. And I want you all, if you just think through this, I know that you can come up with some of these things. When you think through this, is there an investment required to move a body of four to 500 people to a different facility? Yes, okay? Yes, there is. And the place that we're going is not necessarily set up so that we can just walk in and have service on the next Sunday. It's just not like that. There's an investment that's required. Now, I'll lay out the real practical part of the decision because I, I don't blame you for asking some of these questions, so I'm going to put them out there. Uh, in terms of uh, this move, we looked at this really through the lens of shepherding. This, this move is being made through a shepherding lens. How do we best care for, tend to the people that God has brought to our church? That also includes, that includes not only space, but it also includes finances. Okay? Now, when you talk about space, we have put 400, you know, 380 to 450 people in this room six or seven times since January. Now, if you've been with us before, um, you can put 400 people in this room. Is it a really pleasant experience? No, okay? It's actually sweaty and smelly. It's kind of like a middle school locker room after football practice, all right? Um, not necessarily the best environment, always. But over here, this is even a bigger concern for us. Over here on the other side of this walls, we've got probably 70 kids over there, and sometimes the classrooms go up to 20 kids in one room. Now, for some of y'all, that, you know, that may not even pique your interest because you're like, well, at school, you know, you might have 30 in there. Well, yeah, you know, for school, you know, with desks where they're like kind of locked into them with handcuffs, you know, around their ankles. 
and, you know, trained teachers and all that kind of stuff. But for church, where there's no desk, where we're doing the setup with chairs and tables and things like that, and our serve team who is volunteering their time and a desire to disciple them in the best way we can, I'll just put it like this. We have thought for a long time that we could do better. We've thought for a long time that we could do better. So one issue when we move over to ACOE that I'll share with you guys is we will have the opportunity to more than double our space. And that includes our sanctuary space, but also our children's space. We're going to have more classrooms for our kids so that we can be more intentional about the discipleship and the safety of our children. And that's something that's very important to us. It also means that on Easter, no two services next year. No splitting the church. This has been a big issue for us as a staff that we've talked about as a long time. And we have decided that we value greatly us all being in one room all at one time as much as we can possibly do it. I'm not saying never. I'm not making some promise that I can never, you know, never keep or whatever the case may be. I'm just saying it is a great value of ours that we want to all be in one place at one time together as a church. And that includes if we want to pull our children in for a family service, right? You know, or, you know, those special ones like Easter or Christmas or whatever the case may be, we would like to be all together. Now, let me give it to you from a stewardship issue perspective, okay? Stewardship. Um, just because I guess God has, been, has, has blessed us, you know, through relationships, uh, well, let me get to the next thing. I'm going too fast, okay? We talked about a Coe Middle, July 7th, 10.30 a.m. Uh, let me go through Sea Kids Ministry really quickly. Sea Kids Ministry, when we move over, we're going to have more classrooms, probably as many as three or four new classrooms for our children. We're going to have the freedom to introduce even more inductive study elements with our kids. We're also going to work towards, as I mentioned earlier, bringing some of our, fifth, our, our elementary kids, not just our fifth graders, into the worship environment, but still allowing them to do their Bible study time back here as a part of Sea Kids. And we haven't felt the freedom to do that. Because before school got over, to bring, you know, 20, 30, 40 kids over and put them in here, we did not have the freedom to do that because we simply did not have the space. The other aspect of this that I forgot to mention earlier in our tip time today as well as today is I don't know what the Lord's doing here exactly, but the Lord has given us an opportunity to minister to a bunch of kids with special needs. I, I don't know where that came from. I don't know why. I don't know why us. I, I'm not exactly sure, but the ratio is relatively high for the number of students that we have back here. And you know what you need to minister to special needs kids? You need space and you need people. Okay, and right now we do not have the space. Okay, and it affects them and it affects others. So that's an area that we want to be able to grow in. Okay, another change that's on the horizon for us, and I'll get back to the kind of wrapping up some of the reasons for this in just a minute. Uh, right now, we have a church office space that we have also used for our youth ministry. It's a grand total of like 1,200 square feet, roughly, 1,100 square feet. Less than a thousand usable square feet, <laughs> especially when you add in all the stuff we've moved against the walls. Whole another issue right there, okay? Um, we have a very small uh, space at the old woolen mill that we have used for offices as well as our youth ministry. That simply is it, it's not what we need right now, okay? So we are on the verge, and I say the verge, I'm not going to be absolutely specific here because we've agreed on everything in principle, and we should sign a lease agreement next week uh, to lease what will be a multi-purpose facility. Again, I'm not going to say exactly where. It's in spitting distance of here, okay, that will be our offices, but it also has a space that's probably uh, 3,000 square feet you know, or so, maybe a little bit less than that, but a space where we can have worship with up to 150 people or perhaps events with up to 80 to 100 people around round tables that we will be able to use for our office space, for storage, for youth ministry every week, and it will be extremely accessible, okay, as well as to be able to do events that we've been renting for all the time. When we did our first missions meeting this year, we rented Johnston Woods. 
When we do youth ministry this Sunday night, we'll be renting the weaver's room because we're bringing up all these fifth graders into our youth ministry, and we were slammed in our office space, okay? When we do the women's event Saturday, we're renting the weaver's room again for that because we don't have a place for it. This space will be able to accommodate all those things and more, and we'll be able to go to it and use it any time we want to because it will be ours at least by lease, right? You know, we'll, we'll be renters, but nobody else is going to be in there. Now, in terms of the stewardship side of these, you might be thinking, okay, well, if you're going to more than double your worship capacity, and if you're going to go from a 1,100 square feet to what is roughly 4,500 square feet for offices, storage, and a multi-use facility, it's going to require a large investment, right? Right? Yeah? We're actually going to spend less money renting those two places than we are right now for what we have. Okay, Part of this is a stewardship issue. And I want you guys to know, one of the questions that you could be asking is, well, why aren't you doing a permanent place? Like, why aren't you buying something? And I want you to know whether or not you have wondered that or not. The most common question that we get as a church, the most common question, survey says, why don't you have a building and when are we getting one? Okay. That's the number one answer, you know, in that, to that question. Well, short version is this. I want to remind you that we're two years old, okay? Nobody in their right mind is going to loan us a whole bunch of money, number one. Number two, it probably wouldn't be wise for us to go and, and, and ask for a lot of money with a high interest rate, okay? Number three, up to this point, the Lord hasn't brought us anything that would be suitable for the needs of our church, we can't just go get a little small storefront space, okay? And he hasn't given us the resources that it would take to invest in the amount of investment it would take for us to have a more permanent facility, okay? So it simply is practical, and it's stewardship-based. So we are still in a season where we're still going to be portable and where the main goal for us is twofold. We want to be generous as a church. We want to support mission work and missionaries. And we want to be uh, nimble. We want to be quick on our feet. If people in our church have a need that we can meet practically as a church, we want to be generous as a church while also at the same time saving and saving and saving so that we can be flexible in the day when God brings us the right opportunity. And y'all hear my heart in this, okay? Because here's what I don't want to do. I don't want us to have a mortgage that is so great that we cannot be about ministry one day. Do y'all hear me on that? I do not want us to have a mortgage that is so high that we are always concerned with paying the bill so that we cannot minister to people. All right? And I'm just telling y'all, I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody. I'm not talking about any specific thing. I'm just letting you know that that happens in churches all the time. We've got to have the thing. We've got to have the space. We've got to have the room. We've got to have the thing, okay? We've got to have that. I don't want us to be driven by that. And I understand, that requires participation from everybody in our church. But I want you all to know that is where we are coming from. And that's why I call this a shepherding decision as far as where we're going right now. Now, it's not going to be without difficulty. It's not going to be without difficulty. As a matter of fact, one of the difficulties, at least in the beginning, of pulling the trigger on this decision was financial. Because there is a major investment that's required for us to go from this place to another place to be able to have church. It's going to require a large investment. And in fact, that's why this process has taken as long as it has conversations with our board, with people in the church, with the staff, over and over and over and over again, and putting out the fleece, okay? And that was one of the things about the fleece is, God, is this financially wise for us? Because we can save money in rent, sure, every month. But what about the investment it takes right here? Is that really, is that really a good give and take, or is this just a shell game that we're playing? Or Like, what's the deal here? And we started praying, and we asked if God would provide. Now, y'all been here before. Have I brought this need to you guys? Have I brought this need to y'all yet? Do, do y'all have your card where I asked you to like give the thing? Do, sell the thing? Do y'all have that? You don't have yours? You sinners. Okay. We asked God to speak into this. Well, number one, Akoe Middle has worked with us greatly on the rent. They have been like really, really kind to us, to say the least. 
Number two, Ocoee Middle is going to contribute uh, a sum amount of money to this process of moving in because they're going to get to benefit from this. I'll tell you about that in just a second. Number three, uh, the local Coca-Cola bottling company, uh, they gave us a grant of $30,000 to go towards this. Okay? All right? Now, I, I am thankful to Coke, and I'm thankful to Ocoee, but you know who I'm really thankful to? Y'all tell me. That's God's money, y'all. Like, he is the one who is providing that. And we believe that he has provided a way so that this makes sense and so that it's fulfilling our goals of shepherding our body, whether that be people, whether it be process, whether it be finances, whatever the case may be. We think that God has prompted us to make this decision and he is providing for us to do so. Now, we're still going to have skin in the game. We're still going to have skin in the game, even with those other people participating. But here's a super cool thing, and I, and I would like this to happen more in our church and in churches. Um, I had a meeting with Cleveland Middle the other day to let them know that we were wrapping up our time here. Okay, And I don't think it was totally unexpected. As a matter of fact, when we signed the lease agreement here a little over two years ago, they were kind of hedging their bets a little bit. Okay, And this, this is what I remember them saying. Hey, we're good with this for now, which they had to be when we did have a contract, okay? But they're like, this isn't forever, just so you know. This isn't forever, okay? We're not opening the doors of the school to y'all forever. Like, okay, okay, got, got that, okay? Had the meeting with them the other day. Uh, their assistant principal, who is a pastor's son, okay, he's a PK, he said, hey man, I just want you to know that uh, as a pastor's kid, I wasn't necessarily expecting it to be this way. But you guys, every single person I've met from the church has been so classy and so helpful and just so good to us. And y'all have left the facility every week for over two years better than you found it, okay? And it has been a joy to work with you guys and to serve you guys in this. And then the principal, she was the one who, you know, who initially probably had the most hesitation, although she agreed to work with us. She looked at me, and these were her words in the meeting the other day. She'd ha she said, hey... I just want you to know, this has been such a good experience working with y'all's church that I have had other principals call me and ask me because they have had people approaching them about starting churches in their schools. They knew we had one in the school, so they called me and asked me what was our experience like and would we recommend doing it. And she said, I told them it has been nothing but positive and it has been a win for our school. And if I were you, I wouldn't have any hesitations to do so. It, to do so. And so she told me, she said, I think there will be other church plants starting in this town in schools because of how well this partnership went. Okay? I think that's phenomenal. Yeah, you can cheer for that. Now, here's the part that I want you guys to understand that is not just because of the staff of our church. You guys have invested like blood, sweat, and tears in this facility over the last two years. And I mean every one of those. Blood, sweat, and tears literally have flowed in this school over the last couple years over setup and tear down and all the things that we've had going on in here. That is part of the fruit of your participation. The gospel has gone out. We have seen many people in this church baptized in the last, in the last year. All right? We have seen people come to know the Lord. We have seen so much sanctification and growth and community and the reputation in this town and in this school. We have been able to invest in. You have invested in this school. Some band equipment that, that belongs to the band here at this school. Uh, taking part in that projector that's sitting back there in the back that belongs to this school. We are leaving this school better than we found it and with a positive reputation and partnership that has happened with this school. Okay, And I wish I could say it's always like this. Now when I say investment at Ocoee Middle School, y'all check it out. Investment into what? We're, we're going to have the privilege to partner with Ocoee Middle so that we completely upgrade all of their audio, video, everything in their gymatorium, which is where we're going to meet. And when we leave that place, it will be completely theirs. It's going to be their equipment. So the scenario we're talking about is a win for us. It's a win for them. It's partnership with others. Okay, And it's in the name of the advancement of the gospel. Community is going to benefit. The school is going to benefit. Our church, we believe, is going to benefit. All right? But it is not without risk. 
one of the first questions that people ask today. We, we, we had this conversation in a shorter version. Some of you are like, yeah, I wish I would have heard that one. Uh, we had the shorter version in our, <laughs> in our, I know, man, I would have thought the same thing. We had the shorter version in our tip time today for our volunteers because some of them right now are back there, you know, ministering to our kids and then you would have come out of the service and been like, we're moving the church. And they're like, well, I didn't know, and I'm back here serving, okay? So we had a short version with them during our tip time before today. One of the first questions that people asked or somebody asked was, do you expect people to leave because we're moving? It's a fair question. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. But I want you to know we didn't make the decision based on whether we're going to grow or whether we're going to shrink or whatever the case may be. We based it on wanting to grow, not necessarily to grow, you know? It was a shepherding decision. And we'll let God be in charge of the rest of those things. So, with all these changes, with all these changes that are happening, office space, Youth ministry will probably change spaces the 1st of July. You know, our worship is changing spaces the 1st of July. Everything's going to be different. Oh, by the way, the staff told me to mention these things. Do y'all want good news or bad news about the move first? Good news or bad news? I got two pieces of news. You want good news or bad news first? All right, bad news is the biggest thing that's going to be a hazard, hazard for us is parking is not going to be easy, as easy at Ocoee Middle as it is here. And I want to warn you all about that. We're going to work on it. We're going to plan for it. We're going to, we're going to do everything we can to, you know, to try to facilitate that. But it's not going to be as easy just because of the geography of the area and where the parking's located. And I'm letting you know that ahead of time. All right? All right, now that's left with the good news. You know what the good news is? I was told I had to share this. You can bring your coffee in when we have worship over there. Okay, just so you know. All right. And that was really just for Jeff. Jeff, I don't know if y'all have noticed or not, but he's been breaking the rules for like two years. And it's all something about his... It's something about like his... This is what he says. It's like, oh, my, my throat hurts and I, I have to sing. Me, 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 me. Okay, but... So it's really for his conscience is what it is. So with all these changes, what's not going to change? Okay. Well, our mission and vision as a church will not change one iota. Our mission is discipleship, discipleship within the context of relationship. The way that we commit ourselves to that is our vision. It's the four W's. It's the word, it's witness, it's witness, and it's worship. And that comes out of Acts chapter 2. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That last verse right there is where I get the idea of, hey, we want to grow, but we're not worried about growing. Okay? Why? We want to grow in fellowship. We want to grow in the Word. We want to grow in sanctification. We want to grow in mission. We want to grow in community. We want to grow in those things. And you know, if we do grow, it'll be because God grows us numerically. That we're going to leave that on his plate. That is his job. Not that he doesn't produce the fruit and all the other things, but I think that's fair is to say that he is the one who's going to produce that if he wants to, and we will be about the job of shepherding and tending to and doing the things that we need to do. It also won't change our center, okay? It won't change our center, like who we are. And that really comes down to the ministry of the word. You find that in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows are being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, in terms of ministry philosophy, some of y'all have heard me say this and some of you have not. We are truly what can be defined as a simple church. 
We don't have as many programs as a lot of churches. We don't have as many events, okay? Um, but we are available to people. We want to invest in people, and we want to be ready in season and out of season to preach and proclaim God's Word. And we want to allow God's Word to counsel our church and to direct our church and to, to minister to people through our church. And our staff, it's part of the time that they're not investing in, in, in all the different programs and events they're with you guys. They're, they're with each other. They are spending time with people and investing in people. And we believe that that, along with prayer, is the ministry of the Word. And that's who we are, and that is our center as a church. None of those things are going to change. And by the way, is the church a place? Is it a building? No. It's a people, okay? It's a people indwelled by the Spirit of God, ruled by the Spirit of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, directed and led by God's Word, that will not change, and that is not changing, even though some of the physical location things is about to change. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with this morning, I'm actually going to get through on time. That's, that's kind of a miracle to me as well. The last thing I want to leave you with is a, uh, a quote from a book that uh, the guys, the staff and I, are reading together right now. Uh, it's in reference to the moving of the Holy Spirit, but I think it could relate to the entire church as well. Okay, check this out. It's been a good one. I've been meditating on it a lot the last week or so. You can study sailing. You might even be able to build a sailboat. You can seek counsel from the wisest and most veteran of sailors. You can cast your boat onto the most beautiful of lakes under a bright and inviting sun. You can successfully hoist the sail. But only God can make the wind blow. You know, guys, what's the point of me sharing that? We're not trying to make the wind blow here, okay? It's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to be faithful to what God has put in our hands, to, to what He wants us to do. Only God can make the wind blow. That we know that no facility, no amount of money, no approach, no methodology, no message, no person, no staff, no program, no event. We know that none of those things can make the wind blow, amen? Only God is responsible for making the wind blow. So we're going to be faithful to what he's put in our hands. And we're going to ask him to be in control of everything else. Now, fed you guys through a fire hose this morning. Most of you walked in having no idea, no earthly idea, what was coming this morning. I'll do something I'm not supposed to do. I invite your questions. Y'all can find any of the staff's email on our website, thechapelcleveland.com. If you want to email an encouragement, I'll take that too. But if you got a question, if you want to sit down and talk, and you want to hear more about this process, okay, we can, we can do that. You want to hear more about our structure and accountability and those involved? We can do that, okay? Because we understand we are a body. We are together. We are unified. And we think God's going to continue to do great things. We're counting on him to continue to do great things. And man, before I pray with you guys, I'll just say this. The last two years for me and for the staff have been an absolute privilege to serve you guys. As far as like ministry endeavors and, or work or whatever the case may be, this has been, in that context, you know, I'm, I'm not counting, you know, my family and stuff like that. This has been one of the greatest privileges of my life, to participate in this work and this ministry and to see what God is doing. And we're praying that it will continue. Let's bow, let's pray together. Father God, we've said it a couple times today, but we give all the glory to you. For every piece of fruit, for everyone who has turned from sin, for everyone who is identified with you through baptism, through everyone who's participated in missions, for all the sanctification that's represented by the people in this room, for those who are pursuing you, even right now through difficulty, Father. Father, for every praise that's gone up in this place, for every prayer that we have uttered, for any piece of fruit, no matter how big or how small, the, 
the reputation, the name that, that you've helped us develop with people here as, as your representatives, as your priests. We give you all the credit. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And we keep none for ourselves. And for however long you plan for us to be, and for however long you plan for us to serve, help us to remain faithful to these things, these things that we've talked about today. And Father, we do ask for your blessing in the next season. Give us wisdom. Give us guidance. Help us to be faithful in all these things. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Why don't you guys stand up together?